With this conference, we are inaugurating a new licentiate program in leadership and management. We are honored by the presence of His Eminence Cardinal Tagle, the Prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of the Peoples, who will address us later. We are happy to greet the students, particularly those, the first class of the new licentiate program, who were able to make it to Rome despite all obstacles. And we extend our greeting to those who are following us in streaming thanks to the information and telecommunication technologies, which the Second Vatican Council, car Council called marvelous achievements. And they are indeed marvelous because you who are with us in streaming can follow this event. I ask now Father Nuno Gonzalves, the rector of our university, to address us. Your Eminence, dear professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, the Faculty of Social Sciences takes today an important step with the inauguration of a new academic program, the Licentiate in Leadership and Management. This Licentiate completes the educational offer of the faculty and aims to be a response to a need of the church in the administration of its properties and resources. This need was presented to us by the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, whose prefect we have the honor in welcoming among us. I greet you, Eminence, and I offer you my best wishes in appreciation for the encouragement and support we receive from you and from the congregation. The COVID-19 pandemic has increasingly highlighted the importance of a correct management of resources. In the same way, it has highlighted the many weaknesses and inconsistencies of the prevailing economic models. As a matter of fact, the proper attention towards those most in need is not guaranteed, especially in a time of serious crisis such as the one we are living. This, become, this becomes apparent in examining the statistics of the lim limited numbers of those who have access to the vaccination campaigns in different continents within the framework of the current pandemic. Furthermore, attacks on our shared environment, often motivated by easy and immediate profit, threaten the future of our planet and its sustainability. We struggle to realize that the very survival of humanity depends on a correct management of the limited resources we have at our disposal. Tackling these challenges requires study and, exper and expertise. It is the church's responsibility to be on these frontiers where the future of humanity is at stake. It is my belief that the new licentiate in leadership and management will form well-trained men and women who will have the church social doctrine at heart in their future missions. My encouragement and best wishes go to the new students in view of the two years of study they have ahead of them. I also thank the dean and the professors who in such a difficult period have prepared the academic program that we are inaugurating today. Many thanks and best wishes to all of you. Thank you very much, Father Rector. 
I invite now Father Fernando de la Iglesia, a professor of the Faculty of Social Sciences, who was very intimately involved with the new program and is also coordinating it. Thank you very much. Can we have? Okay. This year, the academic offer of the Pontifical Gregorian University includes a license on management and leadership. This is obviously a significant novelty for our university. It is a program of studies in business administration imparted here in the church and for the church, addressed specifically to those who in the local churches are administrators of institutions such as schools, hospitals, publishing houses, consumer cooperatives, shrines, as well as the financial resources of diocese. For the Gregorian, it is an important part of the vast educational network of the Society of Jesus. In fact, worldwide, we find 26 schools of business administration only in the United States, 25 in Latin America, five in Europe, one in the Middle East, 12 in India, five in the Far East, and two in West Africa. In our network, an expanding interaction has led to the creation of various associations as the colleagues in Jesuit Business Education and the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools. Throughout the development of our project, we were able to count on the advice and collaboration of these sisters institutions. Binding agreements have been signed with some of them, while with others the collaboration is less formal, although equally intense. We have this completed a program that includes all the pertinent educational aspects. We have thus completed a program that includes all the pertinent educational aspects of highly qualified international teaching staff composed by North Americans, Germans, French, Spaniards, and Italian academics. These include six Jesuits. The widespread growth of business schools between the educational network of the Society of Jesus is deeply rooted in its own tradition, notably in the Ignatian criteria for choosing ministries. If we read the Constitutions, numbers 622, it is said that consideration should be given to where there is greater need to where greater fruit is likely to be gained. Should be considered too that the more universal the good is, the more it is divine. It is always desirable to have a multiplier effect. Finally, we should work where the opposite mindset seems to be more dominant. With regard to the first criterion in our words of deeply marked by the corporate performance, it is obvious that it is an urgent need to train competent professionals imbued with genuine Christian mindset. As for the second criterion, experiences such as the economy of communion mentioned by Pope Benedict in the encyclical Caritas in Veritate and in many more cases, cases show that a different economy and other modalities are possible, that there is the utopia, that here the utopia may well take root. Business is an essential institution in society. It is the means by which goods and services that affect everyone's standard of living are provided. This is an essential part of the common good. Likewise, 
his activities at intra et at extra affect many groups, those called as stakeholders. Investing in the searchable formation of business leaders means often for the formation of individuals who will multiply the good in society. Ignatius referred to prominent figures as prince, lords, magistrates, administrators of justice. Today, he would include the managers, and not only of the multinationals, but also of the small and medium-sized enterprises. Today, as we have found after the financial crisis of 2008, we have an economy without virtue. Perhaps more than ever before, business activities are lacking a climate conductive to the growth of a genuine virtues, absolutely opposed to venality, coverings, and greed. Because in this area, the war is really war, absolutely opposed to what the is the message of Jesus. Therefore, in institutions run by the church and by the society of Jesus, the intention is obviously to promote a Christian spirit so that the students may not become speculators. It's very different to be a speculator or to be somebody who wants to create wealth to be distributed instead of being selfish and not to having at heart the good of the society. Our license in the church for the church stresses this approach. Well, the license in leadership and manage reflects our twofold challenge. We aim for a solid academic education leading to excellence inspired and um, fostering a Christian, ecclesial, and Jesuit spirit. That's why it incorporates a reflection on identity with five dedicated courses. Business leader vocation, absolutely essential according to the document of Justicia at Pax. Business ethics, ethical finance, canon law and asset management, Catholic social thought, Pope, uh, Boitigua used to say that that was the mystery of the mysteries, the secret, the better kept. It's our honest conviction that in the remaining 24 courses, we, are, we have done the work and we can consider it then equally permitted by this guiding principle. Here you have the distribution, first term, four courses, business, vocation, ethics, workplace and internal and external communication, accounting, geopolitics, human research and talent management, research methods and data analysis, accounting, marketing, ethica, de la finance, corporate strategy, that's for the first year, social finance, accounting, canon law, impact management, social entrepreneurship, Catholic social teaching, management and religious bodies of strategic pastoral planning, social innovation and sustainability, real estate management, integration seminar, project management, final exam, and thesis. That's for the very end. Well, welcome. Um, good luck to everyone. Thank you, Father de la Iglesia, and we are all, we prayed for a good beginning and also for a good conclusion of this program. Thank you very much for your effort Thank you. toward Thank it. You to anyone. I now turn to, uh, to Cardinal Luis Tagle. He agreed to talk to us about evangelization and resource management as a matter of Christian witness. And whichever you prefer, if you prefer to sit or to stand. 
Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, Father Rector and uh, uh, the professors and the staff and the students. May I know who the students are? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to this uh, university and uh, thank you for entering this program. Yeah. So they will be the first. No. I hope you all finish. And it's not, it's not all of them. Obviously, some, some were had issues with the Green Pass and others. Ah, things. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we pray for our Dean, um, Jacques Leno, no, uh, for his recovery. So my, my task is to reflect on the topic evangelization and resource management, a matter of Christian witness. Uh, I found the formulation of the topic both interesting and consoling. The connection between the mission of evangelization and the management of resources uh, requires serious ex and extensive study an exploration, and as Father said, expertise. But the title of the, the conference given to me proposes a meeting point between evangelization and resource management, namely Christian witness. I, in, pre in preparing uh, my, my sharing, I tried... Uh, various paths, how do I approach this? And not being a social scientist, uh, I ended up deciding that maybe I will just lead you to contemplation. <laughs> I'll just lead you to meditation. After all, it's evangelization, Christian witness, and the management of resources. I will not focus only on the content of evangelization, but also on the dynamics of evangelization as manifested in Jesus and in the early church. And I believe that these dynamic forces or movements that make someone an evangelizer are the same dynamics and forces that make an evangelizer a witness. There is no, no uh, disruption between being evangelized, being an evangelizer, and being a living witness. We also know that the gospel does not leave untouched our view and use of the resources of the earth. The gospel definitely has something to say about our view of and use of the resources of the earth. And we believe that a gospel-inspired management of resources would offer to the world, especially of today, a witness to what Christianity is all about. We have missionaries, we have teachers, we have catechists. They all give a witness to the truth of Christianity. But in our contemporary times, a gospel-inspired management of resources is one such witness. So let us begin our meditation. And if you are tempted to close your eyes, and rest in the Lord, feel free. To, maybe the Lord will tell you something better than uh, what I can propose. Since we are in a Jesuit institution, I give three points. The first point, 
Let us behold Jesus. Let us look again at Jesus. The Gospel of St. Mark narrates, and I quote, After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, 14 to 15. The good news is that God will reign. God will rule. That is good news, especially for a people, a humanity that have suffered a lot in the hands of different rulers. If you tell them God will come and God will establish his rule, that is good news. Good news. But as Jesus proclaimed it, the rule of God, the reign of God, involves also changing our course of life. Repent and believe in God's rule. God comes to offer his rule, but that offer requires a response. The reign of God is the news, the good news that Jesus proclaims. But we know that he is not only the proclaimer of the good news of God's reign. He embodies, he personifies the reign of God. That's why in theology, Jesus is called the gospel in person. He is the good news in person. And simultaneously, it's bearer and it's witness. Now, my question is this. How did Jesus become the evangelizer and the witness of the reign of God? So let us indicate some elements. I cannot go through all the Gospels, but I will choose some elements for our purposes. The first is in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. The temptations. Jesus, in his response to the three temptations, resisted the urgings of the devil to inaugurate the reign of God differently from God's vision. The devil presented another way of inaugurating the reign of God. You, know, you will possess all the kingdoms. You can use magical powers. And you will have the angels at your beck and call. This is the offer. But Jesus resisted that. He shows us a clarity of purpose. Clarity of purpose. And obedience to the one who had sent him. The one who will rule. The one whose kingdom he will inaugurate. And Jesus knows he will follow what the real king has intended, how that kingdom will be established. So, clarity of purpose and obedience to the one who had sent him. The second set of texts no, uh, will focus on another aspect. In Matthew 11, verse 21, uh, 27, Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. 
Now, in the same vein, in a similar tone, Jesus tells Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you, Philip, say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing His works. Wow. Jesus makes tremendous claims like this. And, uh, and those claims got him into trouble. Huh? That's why he was brought to court because of some of these claims. Then listen to these words. The father loves the son and has given everything over to him. John 3. Then Jesus will add, I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and speak. John 12, verse 49. And if we want to have a summary statement, now we can go to John 7, verse 29, where Jesus says, I know the Father because I am from him. And he sent me. Now, this set of texts show us, this shows us that Jesus enjoys full communion and intimacy with the Father, the one who will rule. Full communion. Full intimacy with the Father. A relationship of mutuality with the Father. And he was in perfect harmony with the Father. Which makes him a unique and unmatched witness of God and God's reign. At the same time, from those quotations we see that Jesus possesses the humility. The humility that makes him ready and prompt to receive from the Father. To receive from the Father. He does not count it a disgrace to receive or to even beg from the Father. He views reality from the optic of gift, giftedness. Everything is a gift. And he recognizes the giver. With no pretensions of being the owner, (laughs) the owner of his words and his works, He exercises stewardship of the Father's reign. Steward of the Father's reign. But being a steward does not make him lazy. Some people say, well, I am just a guardian. (laughs) I am just a steward, so I don't care. But no, in Jesus... This stewardship ignites his zeal for the fulfillment of the mission he has received from the Father. I I find this fascinating in Jesus. Communion and intimacy with the Father. Mutuality of relationship with the Father. Humility to receive looking at reality from the optic of gift and giftedness stewardship of the reign of God leading to zeal for the fulfillment of his mission 
and the third text regarding Jesus. No. Uh, how did Jesus, how, how does Jesus deal with his disciples? So we, we focus first on his relationship with God, his Father. How about his disciples? In John 17, verse 24, Jesus says, in the so-called high priestly prayer before he died, this is part of his farewell discourse, Jesus says, Father, they, the disciples, Father, they are your gift to me. And then he prays for them to the Father. He prays for them. Why? He says, because they are yours and everything of mine is yours and everything of yours is mine. I have been glorified in them, in my disciples, who are your gifts. And when he was being arrested in the version of St. John, Jesus boldly tells the guards, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. John 18, 8 to 9. So what we have seen earlier regarding Jesus' relationship with the Father is reflected also in Jesus' relationship with the disciples. The disciples are God's gifts to him. They are not objects. They are not pieces of property to be possessed, used, manipulated, and disposed of when not needed anymore. And Jesus knows he is accountable to the Father for them. And even in his ministry, sinners and those considered outcasts were given a taste of being children of God. They are not rubbish. They are not trash. They are God's gifts. So Jesus exercises stewardship by protecting and saving the, his disciples instead of protecting and saving his own life. And in the end, his life becomes his gift to the others. A circulation of gifts. Everything is gift. And then he becomes a gift. Okay. End of first point. Uh, I'm not saying anything new, no. In fact, I could have said, just read the gospel <laughs> as a summary. But uh, uh, preparing for this talk, I was amazed again at some of these elements and the consistency in what I would call the internal dynamics of someone who proclaims the kingdom, who inaugurates the kingdom, and who embodies the kingdom of God. Now I'll go to the second point. I invite you now to turn to the apostles, the witness of the apostles. They were evangelized by Jesus himself in order to be evangelizers. And I should say that the inner movements or dynamics that we have identified in Jesus' relationship with the Father and his disciples, I think provided the foundation for the evangelizing mission and the witness of the apostles. Some texts. 
the first letter of John, chapter 1, where the Apostle John says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked upon and touched with our hands, concerns the word of life. We proclaim now to you so that you may have fellowship with us. For our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' intimate relationship with the Father was the basis of His mission. Now, the Apostles' first-hand experience, his personal their personal encounter with Jesus becomes the basis of their evangelizing mission. What they have seen, what they have heard, what they have touched of Jesus. And so, in the same first letter of John, the apostle says, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. So their testimony is rooted in their lived experience of Jesus. They experience the kingdom of God personally in Jesus. Now, the second text from Matthew 28, the disciples received from Jesus what they will teach and proclaim. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not in your name, huh? In the name of God. No. I cannot baptize as saying, I baptize you in the name of Luis, Antonio, Tagle. Uh, that's not baptism. That's cheating. So they, they baptize in the name of God. And then Jesus says, teach them to observe all that I, I have commanded you. And Jesus will help the disciples. In John 14, he says, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. So an apostle, a true apostle, can be a faithful witness only if, like Jesus, he or she receives from Jesus with docility to the Holy Spirit. A true apostle must ward off, must fight the pride and the lust to invent his own kingdom. <laughs> His own teaching. We have a good example in St. Paul. He understands very well his role as a steward of the word of Jesus, of the gospel. That's why in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 to 19, he claims, If I preach the gospel, there is no reason for me to boast. If I do so willingly, I have a recompense. But if unwillingly, then I have been entrusted with the stewardship. And what is my recompense? That when I preach, I offer the gospel free of charge. So as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. He considers himself the charge to, to teach as a calling to be a steward of the gospel, which he exercises with vigilance and fidelity. To the Galatians, he says, there are some who are disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. 
So you see he, as the steward who was very particular. This was what I received. So I or even an angel should not tamper with it. But St. Paul, no, as a steward of the gospel, his, his own life was disturbed by that gospel. <laughs> the apostle experiences shifts in his priorities. In Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, 7 to 11, St. Paul says, Whatever gains I had, these I have come to consider a loss because of Christ. More than that, I even consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. A totally different way of looking at gain and loss. Very different from what the world will consider as gain and loss. St. Peter and the other disciples, after having been whipped and ordered not to speak of Jesus again, according to the Acts of the Apostles, they left the Sanhedrin full of joy that they had been judged worthy of ill treatment for the sake of the name. The name of Jesus not selfish gain becomes the primary value. And even suffering for the name of Jesus gives joy. It is a gain. End of second point. So probably some of you are, where is this leading? <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> but you could see some of the elements that uh, in, in manifested to us by Jesus and the disciples in evangelization and witnessing. You see the terms that we have been using, no? Stewardship, receiving, gift, accountability to the Lord, no? To the Father who sent me. Vigilance. You could see some of them. Not selfish gain. Not making a name for myself. Not building my own kingdom. But the, with the clarity of purpose. The values of the kingdom. The values of Jesus reign supreme. Now, for the last point. I go to managing resources as part of Christian witness. So please bear in mind what we had already seen in Jesus as fundamental values and with the apostles as witnesses. The dynamics that made Jesus and the apostles not only evangelizers, but witnesses or embodiments of the same gospel apply to the management of resources. St. Pope Paul VI in Evangelii Nunciandi, number 18, says that evangelization must reach all strata of humanity and all aspects of human life, including business, including the management and use of resources. The gospel must enter that. But we must witness to the gospel there, there. And Pope Francis follows the same trajectory, especially in Evangelii Gaudium and in Fratelli Tutti and in Laudato Si. Now, we can add that the gospel must continuously reach and penetrate all strata of the life and mission of the church, including 
our management of resources in the church. By repentance and a renewed faith in the gospel, we hope that persons, institutions, policies, and practices involved in the management of resources, not only in the business world, but inside the church, would give witness to how God rules in Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. We need to be evangelized to evangelize others. And so we need to review our own management principles, choices, and practices in the light of the gospel, the witness of Jesus and the, the apostles. Let me give a few examples. First, we saw in Jesus and the apostles how finding one's treasure in God's reign, in God's rule, is needed for the conversion of the heart, both the heart of persons and of institutions. Jesus says in Matthew 6, store up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor decay destroys, nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. Where is, what is the treasure of the diocesan finance officer? Is it the kingdom of God? For where his or her treasure is, you will find his or her heart. Another element related to the management of resources as Christian witness. Trust in God, the giver. Trust in providence. God gives. Trusting in God and God's providence puts, puts the management of resources in its right place. Please, I am not saying that trusting in God means we don't need to manage. No, no. Trusting in God puts management in its proper place in the greater scheme that we call the reign of God. Let us recall Jesus' admonition. He says, all, this, all these things, you know, what are we to eat, what are we to wear? He says, all these things the pagans seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things will be given you besides. Without trust in God, without recognition of the God who cares, who gives, without trust in God, important things like justice, important things in God's reign might be sidelined in favor of a mad, crazy search for profit and security. Remember the story of the multiplication of the loaves. The disciples were an image of calculation and pragmatism. Oh, we need, they're very fast in calculating. We need 200 days wages to be able to feed all of this. Wow, they have an internal calculator. And so they said, send them home. Send them home. Now, calculation and pragmatism, that's good and useful. But we should not allow that to hinder faith and service. So Jesus' trust in God, in God's blessing, and Jesus' trust in people's offering generosity, five loaves, two fishes. Jesus trusts the capacity of people to think of the common good, 
Jesus' trust made the multiplication of the loaves and fish possible. Jesus manages with trust in God and in providence. The horizon of gift never leaves the vision of Jesus. Another example, the early Christian communities in the Acts of the Apostles, listening to the Word of God, gathering for the Eucharist and prayer, nurturing community life, these things inculcate freedom, freedom from obsessive possession and accumulation of goods. And the community was set free. They became just, charitable. They started sharing with neighbors. That was described in Acts 2, 42 to 47. And because the people saw how prayerful they were, how they listened to the word of God, and how charitable they were, according to, to the Acts, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. We are all worried. How do we add numbers to our vocations? So we have posters, we have videos. Why not try what the early communities did? They gave, the community gave a witness. No one was in need. They cared. They shared. They sold their properties and gave the proceeds to the apostles who distributed them. And in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira hid a portion of, of the prophet and they died. So surrender what you have to your religious superior. <laughs> Lying and greed should not be part of the management of resources meant for service of the poor. St. Paul himself praised the Macedonians who themselves were poor but they took up a, uh, a collection for the needy people in Jerusalem. Already at that time, universal charity. You don't think only of the needs of my place. You think of the universal uh, community. And so St. Paul presents the Macedonians to, to the Corinthians as an example of those who follow Jesus, who, though rich, became poor so that we might become rich. Another text, stewardship. Stewardship must lead to creativity, initiative, and even taking risks. In Matthew 25, the parable of the master who gave talents to three uh, servants, you know, the two, were good uh, stewards. They knew what the mind of the, of the owner was, and so they behaved accordingly. Whereas the other one, without any initiative, he hid the, uh, the, the treasure, and he uh, was kicked out. James, the letter of James, chapter 5, 1 to 6, warns against a type of management of wealth where you want to make it grow, yet you do not pay your laborers. So the growth in money comes at the expense of the poor and the laborers. That is not management. That is injustice. That is inhumanity. So, the observance of justice and the rights and respect for the rights of the poor makes for an authentic management. And let us not forget that human beings are our best resource in the church. 
like what Jesus told God the Father. They are your gifts to me. It will be in the church a failure in management of resources if money, investments, buildings, documents are all in order while the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the community given for the common good are neglected and wasted. We are accountable to God. How did you manage the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Some of the gifts are not even recognized. Some of the gifts are ignored. Some of the gifts are not allowed to bear fruit. 1 Corinthians 12. But to each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And St. Paul proposes how to manage the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the community. Love. Love. And finally, in the teachings of Jesus, we see how he uses elements of nature, the cycles of seasons, the rain, the seeds, the earth, the plants, the, the fruits of the earth, the work of human hands as parables and signs of the reign of God. So caring for creation, especially as advocated by Pope Francis in uh, Laudato Si. You know, and these days, uh, the season of creation. You know, and uh, like this morning, I, was, uh, I attended that uh, uh, academic act in uh, another university. You know, uh, for a program also, you know, uh, a new program uh, on uh, caring for creation. Now, this is another part of managing resources as Christian witness, but all rooted in the experience of Jesus and the early disciples. I don't have time, but uh, you might want to think, Time is also a resource. How is that being managed? Cultures are our resources. How do, we, do, 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 do cultures enter our management uh, uh, schemes? No? Uh, canon law was mentioned a, a while ago. I, I believe some provisions of canon law uh, safeguard the, Christ, the gospel witness in the administration of the goods of within the church. Canon 1254, yes, the church has the right to acquire, retain, administer, and alienate temporal goods, but always in line with the church's objectives to provide for divine worship the upkeep of the clergy and the ministers, and the apostolate and charity. Uh, Canon 1267, whenever there is a donation, <laughs> the presumption is it is not a donation to the priest, unless it is specified. If it is not mentioned, then it is a donation to the juridic person, the parish. So give it there. Respect the will of the donor. Ah, stewardship. Yeah. The donor, the giver, must be respected. Don't forget in Canon 1271, don't forget the contribution of the dioceses to the universal church. No? October, World Mission Sunday. Propaganda feed. <laughs> That's a part of management, you know, universal charity. Canon 1286. Just wages must be paid. Canon 1287. The pastors must report to the local ordinary and to the people. 
how uh, the resources, especially money, uh, are used. So I conclude. I say a church community, like a parish, a diocese, a religious institute, a church organization or a lay movement, or whatever, a church community that imbues their evangelization programs with the right gospel spirit receives support from the faithful. The faithful uh, 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 give, <laughs> they, they donate to groups that are active in mission and evangelization. So the best way to awaken generosity among the faithful is to provide them the witness of a generous, humble, just, responsible mission or ministry. If you are lazy in, in evangelization, do not expect sharing of resources on the part of the faithful. Manage your evangelization mission and programs so that you will have resources to manage for mission. If you don't manage your evangelization, you will have nothing, no resources to manage. And let the reign of God, personified in Jesus, manage your management. And I find it fitting to close with a prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola that expresses in an extraordinary way what I have been struggling <laughs> to share with you. Take and receive, O Lord, my liberty. Take all my will, my mind, my memory. All things I hold and all I own are thine. Thine was the gift to thee. I all resign. Do thou direct and govern all and sway. Do what thou wilt, command, and I'll obey. Only thy grace, thy love on me bestow. These make me rich. All else will I forego. Thank you.